What's up, guys? Here with your FC Wonder Kid, episode 148. Mm. Here with my guy, Bretson. How are you? Uh, I'm doing wonderfully. Thanks for asking, Alex. I hear you're feeling a whole lot better after a week of being, you know, sick. And I think you got maybe a case of the football itis. I don't know. There's <laughs> just so much football going on. We've got the UCL draw. We've got the UEL draw. I mean, there's even some interesting matchups in the conference league. True. Uh, and we've got international call-ups because a international break is upon us soon enough. And mm -hmm. beyond that is like the end of the rainbow for football fans everywhere with all the crazy, crazy matchups coming. Dude, I'm I'm really excited to kind of dig in today. Mm -hmm. um, are, you, are you ready to get going? Where do you want to start? I'm really ready to get going because the Champions League draw did not disappoint. Mm. The matchups will be historic, and I'm sure a lot of storylines will be lined up after the quarterfinals. It's absolutely sure. mad what we're going to see. You wait for Champions League early reaction to the draw of the quarterfinals, and I think it makes sense for us to start with an interesting matchup of the right inside bracket with a PSG against Barcelona. What are you thinking yep. on this match? Because I sure think it's Bull Breton. The history of PSG yep. and Barca shares a lot of players. Neymar, it's mm -hmm. Messi, it's Zlatan Ibrahimovic, it's Dembele, mm -hmm. it's, no, I cannot forget, Arteta, Xavi Simmons, Ronaldinho. <laughs> The history is bold. And even at Daniel. History is bold. Even at mm -hmm. Daniel. Mm -hmm. So many players. Yeah. So many players. I think uh, the most recent mashup between PSG and uh, Barcelona was, what, 2021? And that was obviously the Kylian Mbappe show, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of, I think Mbappe had four of the five goals for PSG in both legs. Yes. Uh, but if you go back even further, you go to probably the most historic recent meeting of PSG and Barcelona. Uh, that was back almost 10 years ago now, 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. when it was uh, PSG running riot mm -hmm. on Barcelona, effectively ending, you would think, their Champions League campaign, winning for nothing <laughs> in Paris. And then they return to camp now and Messi takes over and they win what Neymar. Like six goals. Neymar six took goals. over. Oh my Neymar well, took Neymar did over. Messi too. I mean it Messi, was no. it was a bloodbath. <laughs> it it was a bloodbath in that second leg, right? And uh I, I don't I don't know if um I mean, I think Kylian Mbappe is is un unfortunately going to still be the boogeyman here, mm -hmm. um, and that's why I, I'm pretty confident in saying, and I think you might you might take it a step further, but I feel pretty confident in saying that PSG has what it takes um, to beat Barcelona uh, in this one. I, I just think Kylian Mbappe can get you on this side of the bracket, mm -hmm. can get you very far, can get you to the final, and we know that if you get to the final... Uh, really, anything can happen on the day. It's and true. when you have Kylian Mbappe, oof, uh, I like your chances. So I'm going to say PSG over Barcelona in this one. But what well, are you thinking? Well, and when I hear you talk like this, it's almost like saying PSG is going <laughs> to win the Champions League. And PSG winning the champ PSG winning the Champions League would be the best possible ending of Mbappe's yeah. career at PSG. It would be mm -hmm. so bold that he would be no doubt, no doubt. I already, I think he is, but no doubt he would yep. be perceived as the best PSG player ever, ahead of Neymar, mm -hmm. ahead of Messi. That was there a short time, but he would be the best, and I think that's what he wants to get to because Messi is in the states, Ronaldo's in Saudi Arabia, Mbappe is in mm -hmm. Europe. The legacy is now to be conquered. It, the time is now. Mbappe can beat Barcelona. Three years ago, he scored a hat-trick. Seven years yeah. ago, we saw Mbappe lead a Monaco team against Man City. So now, yeah. seven years after, now he can become the king of the Champions League when Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi are not in Europe right now. But I wanted to ask you this, Bretton, on, on, on the Barca sure. against PSG. It's a battle of Obviously, Mbappe against Barca, but it's the midfield. Mm -hmm. The midfield of Barca yeah. against the midfield of PSG. Who would you pick between the two? PSG with a mm. Vitinha, Warren Zaire Emery, Ugart. And a mm. Barca oh. with Gundogan, Frenkie de Jong, and Pedri. I pick Barca. And this is, yeah. the, and this is where they have to win the game. In the midfield. Even though there's no Gavi, there is a chance. I really believe yeah, there I'm is a chance. 
I'm in complete agreement with you. That is exactly where it needs to be won. And I think that's where the optimism lies for for Xavi, for <laughs> pretty much all of Barcelona right now. Uh, they feel like they do have the upper hand in that midfield. Now, Ugart is capable of having a world beater of a game, but he hasn't necessarily shown it like mm-hmm. consistently this season for PSG. Warren Zaire sure. Emery has had an impact, but he's had an impact outsized at times. But at other times, he has shown that he is just a 17, 18 year old. What is he, 18 now? Um, uh, <clears throat> certainly capable of so much more. Mm-hmm. But you're talking about, yeah, you're talking about Gundawan, who's been there before. Mm-hmm. You're talking about De Jong, who has been there before. And right? Pedri. And though. And, Pe- and Pedri, of course, right. But, like, those are the two that I'd be leaning on, De Jong and Gundogan, for, like, clear experience, mm-hmm. been there, done this. Um, and De Jong's been doing it for a while, but Gundogan, we know what he's done for City, what he meant to City uh, before he <laughs> left. So I, I agree very... That's, like, the clear tip mm-hmm. the scales to the Barcelona side. It's just, I'm more worried, believe it or not. I I know we've always touted the Barcelona defense. Um, There have been cracks shown this season. There's been health issues. Mm -hmm. Um, It it really comes down to Mbappe and Dembele and whether or not Dembele wants to inflict maximum (laughs) penalty on his former club. Uh, And I could see that happening. I Uh... honestly could see that happening. The narrative is just too bright for that to happen. But then again... Lewandowski's been good. You've probably got some guys on the sideline because remember, these are not played. Uh, that will be in the 11 because these games are not played for another three weeks or True. so. So True. So there is time and our picks can change with injuries. Big moments mm-hmm. can change with that players not being able to play for sure. But I think a big factor also in this PSG Barca is La Masia. La Masia never disappoints Bretson. Pau Kubarzi, man of the match against Napoli. And La Mina Mal right now. La Mina Mal right now can be in the talk of the most informed right wingers right now in football at 16 years old. That is mad that it is the case. I'm not saying he's better than Salah, Saka, other right wingers. But La Mina Mal's performing at Barca. And if you're doing that, you must be in the talk. So if La Mina Mal, La Mina Mal's mm-hmm. going to have an early an early uh, look at the rivalry that's going to be happening next season. Mbappe yeah. will for sure will f- Mbappe will for sure want to destroy Barcelona, but yeah. La Masia can stop him. Pau Kubarzi has a chance. Ronaldo Araujo hasn't been dribbled past one time still in the UCL, and obviously La Mina Mal can surprise the world and say. Next season, I'm going to be shining too in La Liga. So I'm excited for this matchup. And I actually think it's the best matchup that PSG and Barcelona could have in terms of magnetism of story. Because their people are curious. And both Mm -hmm. both teams, PSG and Barcelona, are very matched. Very matched. And the greatness yeah. of Barcelona is not just because they're in the quarterfinals. That it, ma- that it has to be congratulated because of the great job of Chafi. But the greatness of Barcelona is shown that 50% of the managers mm-hmm. in the Champions League have a strong w- link with the club. It's Xavi. It's Arteta. It's Pep Guardiola. And it's Luis Enrique. Four managers in the quarterfinals in eight that have a big link with um. Barcelona. So that's the greatness yeah. of the club. Champions League football heritage. Well, and uh, Luis Enrique, I think, is also going to be the difference here. Is it going to mm-hmm. be Xavi? Is it going to be Luis Enrique? And I think, uh, I, I mean, I'm still, I'm still. Xavi. You make some, you make some good points, <laughs> Alex. But for for all the great things that we say about Barcelona's academy, right? For all the great things we say about it, it's like this mm-hmm. baptism by fire stuff. Uh, it it really only feels like it happens in Spain. Mm-hmm. It's insane, right? Because of the quality that comes out. But like True. Pau Kubarsi, uh, barely 17 years old. He's only he's barely even cracked 15 games for Barcelona, and yet he's already. We'll talk about this later. You know, he's already called up mm-hmm. uh, to De La Fuente's um, to La Furia Rojas side, mm-hmm. and and that that in and of itself, like it, that doesn't happen in in England. It especially under Southgate, it doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, it doesn't even really happen in the Netherlands that yeah. often, uh, uh, considering how much of a youth hotbed uh, that place is. So it's insane to me that uh, it's not really insane. It's it, it, I'm jealous in, in many re- respects. I think it's like La how, La but, but it is, it, you're right. It absolutely is. And everything's in the same framework to where like it, they don't see it as baptism by fire. Pau Kubarsi starting a, 
a UCL quarterfinal mm -hmm. uh, when 15 games ago, uh, very few people on this planet, unless you are really deeply rooted in, in mm. looking at La Masia and looking at, you know, young Spanish talents, or listening to you FC didn't Wonder necessarily <laughs> know his name. Or listening to FC Wonder Kid. Exactly. I know our, our listeners knew who he was, but like, it, it is so crazy and it really only happens at Barcelona and it really only happens for me um, in Spain. Like that, that crazily like True. he just leveled up no True. issues just leveled up and you almost think that at some point like he's gonna be found out for his age uh mm -hmm. but uh we've got these fixtures um that will test that theory exactly. i suppose and i don't want to see it happen but at the same time i i i love the fact that barcelona can tout a 17 and a 16 year old and say mm -hmm. like Holy crap! Look at look at these gems. More gems coming down the conveyor belt, uh, leading us potentially to UCL semis, UCL finals. Yep. Maybe even lifting the trophy potentially mm -hmm. based on their side of the bracket. But at the other the other part of me says like protect these protect these kids. No, or yeah. they are just kids. Uh, you I, know, I, I completely agree with you, Bretson. And La Mina Mal and Pau Gubarsi. No, La Mina Mal and Pau Kubarsi, there has to be a 0% chance. I want a zero that they're going to the Olympics. Paris doesn't need you in the summer. Barca needs you at the start of next season. Fully fit. And I think that will be the case for the new Barca manager that will be having two extremely good talents. World-class potential in yeah. two. And Xavi will be remembered for just this. He won the league. He trusted La Masia. And look at the list of mm -hmm. names. Gavi, Balde, Fermin Lopes, La Mina Mal, 16 years old, Pau Cubarzi, yep. Hector Fort, Marquis. So there's so many talents that have been invested by Xavi. And that's what that's his legacy. So he's well, gonna leave with a positive image, and that's what he wants to. He wants to have a rest because ever since he left football, it's like he became a manager straight away. Straight away. Yeah. And you need to have that mm. space of time in which you can rest and really have your ideas clear. And I think Xavi will yeah. have that moment after he leaves. Just Bucks. uh just don't take like a five year hiatus like uh Mr. Zizu <laughs> over there. Uh <laughs> not that Xavi and Zizu are necessarily uh the same managerially, but um Xavi, just come back. Like I'm I'm still angry he's even leaving. The project <laughs> is still very much in motion. Right. Whoa. Um. I mean, mm -hmm. but but listen, I I agree with you. Yeah, they should not. Yeah, Pau Kubarsi and Lamina Mall should not be in Paris. They should have already conquered Paris potentially, uh, <laughs> well before they would have to go there. Um. So mm -hmm. I think uh I think that's the task at hand, and um it really is. It feels very unique to Barcelona, um to be able to put a 17 and a 16 year old on the pitch and then also tout them as literally your two best weapons mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, defending and attacking um, versus a very strong team in PSG. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, you're right. This one is like headlines material going to be watching this uh, for sure. And I think it's not going out of left field to say that the winner of this one, um, the winner Barca? of this fixture has the best possibility of of uh, going to a Champions League final because they will then go on to face the winner of Atletico Madrid and know, Russia. Dortmund. I don't know if yeah, Atletico you don't know. will make it easy though. <laughs> no, but, no, no, that's but for, for sure. Mbappe going, mm -hmm. Mbappe going first against Barcelona and having the chance of knocking mm -hmm. them out, and then maybe going against Atletico de Madrid and having a chance of knocking them out. That is a great warm up for next season with Real Madrid. And if he scores <laughs> hat tricks and he goes bold. Everybody will be mega excited for what's to come. The best player in the world. Well, or Jude mm. Bellingham. Right now, the discussion is real. Mm. But I wanted to mention mm. before the big, the big, the big clash of titans that it, we know it's Real Madrid, Man City, Bayern <laughs> okay. against Arsenal. The storyline yeah. is absolutely magnificent once again. Harry Kane could be having a, trof a trophy-less season, and Arsenal could be having a hand in that happen. That would be a tragedy, maybe, for Harry Kane yeah. to be knocked out yeah. by Arsenal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but this is a Harry Kane that also does have, I believe, like 14 goals in 19 games versus Arsenal. Um, so he very much could could very much could also be uh, the boogeyman um, of Arsenal. We have to remember this is Arsenal's first time in a, in a very long time that they've been in a quarterfinal. I mean, not very long. 
not like 20 years, years. Time, right? I believe 14 20, years. What was it? 14 years. Yeah, there you go. Um, and 20, what was it? 2017 mm. against Bayern. Um, oh, that yes, did not go so well. 2017 so Arsenal Bayern mm -hmm. Munich. They lost 5-1 at yeah. home and they lost 5-1 <laughs> away. 10 yeah. goals conceded. This is the revenge okay. that they need against in this fixture. And Bayern it Munich, is. in their last three UCL campaigns, they were knocked out in the quarterfinals. So the yeah. young team of Arsenal and the veteran team of Bayern Munich both have something to prove. Who do you think, Breton? Who do you think, Breton? <laughs> like, yeah, okay. So the, the practical nature of me that comes out, it says experience trumps anything else right now mm -hmm. right when you're this far into a ucl campaign um but and and also byron i think is probably more more hellbent on winning this thing now that they've essentially lost the bundesliga title um i think that's not a great thing that tips things in arsenal's favor so for me the practicality in me uh probably the boring nature in me i gotta say yeah byron munich does have uh, the experience here because it's not just Harry Kane um, who has a great record against Arsenal. Mm -hmm. It is also obviously all guys that have been there before. Joshua Kimmich um, in particular, he's pepped up. Jamal Musiala has obviously very much pepped up as of mm -hmm. late. They might have Coman. They might have uh, a lot of their guys uh, back for this fixture because it's not until early uh, early April. Um, and they've got past history, which means nothing. Mm -hmm. But they do. They have past history um, in their favor. I mean, even before that 5-1, 5-1 drubbing, uh, I think they also won a game uh, at the one. Emirates 2-0. Two, two yeah, I mean, it's, it's like not good for <laughs> Arsenal. But then again, this is not the same Arsenal team. It's not. It's a very different team. It's a team that is gelling incredibly well it's a team uh that well we know they're going to have a fresh ben white for it mm -hmm. sorry that's probably too soon we'll talk about that later mm -hmm. um but this is a very very uh well-built team that has come and risen i wouldn't say it from the ashes but it has been built incredibly methodically uh by mikel arteta True. um and <clears throat> it is somebody that if there is an arsenal team that's going to uh to beat Bayern Munich, it's it, it's going to be this team. Ah. It is. Uh, but but I'm still leaning with my practical nature, and I am still saying Bayern Munich, and I'm going to say it's tight, very tight. It's whether or not Arsenal can make sure that things do not get out of hand, period. It's it, like Gabriel, Saliba, they, they have to have the game of their life at the Allianz. Mm -hmm. They do. It's true. Arsenal, these are the matchups and big moments that you got to beat. Bayern Munich, currently against Arsenal, is obviously a bigger club. Not just for their national success. Not just for their European success. That is six Champions League titles when Arsenal has zero. It's not just the memberships, but it's the football heritage. And even Arteta. It's his first time in this situation. Thomas Tuchel, he won the Champions League in a London team. <laughs> so even yeah. in, in terms of that But I wanted to say Arsenal, Arteta, Odegaard, Saliba, Saka They mm -hmm. are key factors And I do believe they have it in them To beat Bayern Munich But do I believe it will happen? I don't know because mm -hmm. I've never seen it happen So this can be a tipping point This young team of Arsenal Can show to the world that they are a contender to win towards winning a UCL in the next three, five seasons if Arteta yeah. stays. And this is a new era. An era of Arteta when Jurgen Klopp is leaving uh, Liverpool. When Pep Guardiola could be leaving in two, three years at Man City. Arteta can grab the Premier League and the Champions League in the next three, five years. So uh, I'm, it's it's hard. It's very hard. Yeah. Because I'm, I mentioned football heritage. Clubs that reach the quarterfinals of the UCL mm -hmm. um, hey, in the history of the UCL clubs that reached the quarterfinals uh, Bayern Munich that reached 22 times in first Real Madrid 19 times Barca 14 times Man United 14 times Chelsea 12 times they reached the quarterfinals and in all these clubs I didn't list Arsenal because they don't have yeah. the same football heritage in UCL as Chelsea, yeah. as as, <laughs> as Man United. And I'm not even saying Man City. That is now yeah. the yeah. big team 
in England. So Arsenal, that's what they have to do. And he, there's another factor too, Bretton. Because Bayern What's Munich that? fans decided to throw fireworks uh, yes. in the Lazio Stadium. Well, there's a consequence mm -hmm. for that. They cannot attend the Emirates game. So we could be seeing an Emirates Stadium 100% packed for Arsenal. Oh, and yeah. that's what they need with support. Emirates, you can, can, you can see... Maybe we will see history in the Emirates. But it's still yeah. a maybe. I'm going to go with uh, Bayern Munich still. You are? Yeah. I, and the weird, like, the weird thing is... I don't think there's really an in-between. I, I, I was saying earlier that I might see this as like a tight affair. Um, one that is going to be, you know, a game of inches, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but part of me also feels like one of these teams could break down. Right, it could True. be Arsenal breaking down at the uh, breaking down at the Allianz, or believe it or not, it could be Bayern breaking down at the Emirates uh, because Bayern has been prone to it all season. They've mm -hmm. had breakdowns in the Bundesliga. We've seen it happen. True. Um I forget which game it was, but somebody didn't somebody put a five spot on him. I mean, Lever, Leverkusen put three on him. Yeah, and um I I could see that happening, although I think Bayern are in a better place. It's weird saying that knowing that they're probably not going to win the Bundesliga. Mm -hmm. Um and obviously Jamal Musiala just Oof. okay, it was Darmstadt, but he had himself just one of those ridiculously dominant games. Um but I could see one of them getting wrecked in one of these legs, and then the other one just kind of being a scrap fest. Um, so we'll we'll see. I think this one is going to be a lot less close than the the last one we talked about, which is PSG Barca. True. Um, and but, Arsenal yeah. didn't beat Porto confidently. I don't understand no. those Arsenal fans that say we're a hundred percent contenders to win the Champions League. Well, you will be if you beat a Bayern Munich confidently. But that hasn't True. happened. That hasn't happened. Yeah. I a forty-one-year-old Pep played, a, played 120 minutes against you guys, and he still managed to go to penalties. So why are you so yeah. confident about it? I want to know. Let yeah. us know in the comment section down below if you're Arsenal fans or just explain their point of view on this one. So, Atletico Dortmund, before the big <laughs> clash of titans, how are you feeling on oh this my one? Gosh. What I got to say on this well, one at the start, Griezmann yeah. once again showed mm -hmm. to the world that he's one of the most underrated talents, uh, no, players ever. Griezmann is world class. Griezmann defensively did so much against Inter and the most influential Agreed. player in attack is obviously Antoine Griezmann too. I agree with the statement that you said in the past, Bretton. Griezmann is the top five player in the world right now because this he man is. is carrying Atletico de Madrid. All-time leading goals. He is, he is, and it takes a lot to perpetuate. I mean, it, I'm so bummed for Inter just because, yeah, as I said previously, I thought Inter... Uh, was rounding into being the most in tune, ready to go type of team. Lautaro was scoring goals left and right, but Lautaro fell back on the criticism that f seems to follow him. And mm -hmm. there's a grain of truth to it is that he doesn't step up in really big games. And yeah. unfortunately that gets perpetuated because guess who does? Mm -hmm. Antoine Griezmann. Antoine Griezmann steps up. Hell, I'd even argue like Alvaro Marata steps up in big <laughs> games. But um, this one, you know, it's the Axel Witzel uh, slugfest, if you would like to call it that. But I, I don't see this as Atletico versus Dortmund. I actually see this as uh, Diego Simeone versus Aiden Terzic. Hmm. Advantage, Atletico. And I see this as Antoine Griezmann versus kind of not really a star leading the way. Yeah, Julian Brandt can be great. Yeah, Marco Royce can can still d dictate a game. Yeah, Jaden Sancho scored a goal. Um, we'll see what happens beyond this, but uh, it's going to be Borussia Dortmund's collective uh, versus Atletico Madrid's Antoine Griezmann, Diego Simeone, of which they both have. That's two big advantages to Atleti. Mm -hmm. They also have more pedigree uh, as of late in terms of being able to do this, right? Atleti True. always seems to be very strong in Champions League play. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to say, and and they just overcame who I thought was one of the best candidates to win the damn thing, and that's Inter. So, uh, and they deservedly won. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, they deservedly yep. won. So Atletico Madrid for me is the uh, the winner here. But then again, you know, here I am waffling. Uh, I've been calling Bo Russia Dortmund the the flipping cockroach uh, of the season. Just when you think they're uh, they're dead and buried, they seem to come back and they seem to win and they seem to scrape out wins. So mm -hmm. you you can't 
ever let your guard down at Signal Aduna. Um, and if you do, it's at your own peril. Um, but I think Axel Witzel knows that. I think uh, others at Atleti know that. And the Wanda is not very hard or not very um, welcoming of a place to play at either. So mm. advantage at Let's Go Madrid because of Simeone, because of Griezmann. Um, that's that's who I'm going with. It's Atleti versus PSG for me in the semifinal. I agree with you. I also go Atletico because even on the stat that at home, El Cholo Simeone in the knockout stages yeah. with Atletico de Madrid. He's never lost a game in Wanda Metropolitano. Yeah. Never <laughs> lost a game. And that's why he stays. That's why he's the icon of this club. And that's why he will stay many more years at Atletico de Madrid. So yep. I agree with that statement, Bretton. And shout out to the Pai. Key goal for the Pai. But the clash yeah. of the two powerhouses of football the two again. best teams in football again it's man city against real madrid and no man city fan and no real madrid fan wanted to get each other this early so no that's a fact okay but yeah us football fans we're excited we're excited. Oh, very, it's Jude Bellingham very. versus Erling Haaland. It's Kevin De Bruyne oh, wants to prove himself against a Kroos and a Modric. Or even a Fede Valverde. It's Ancelotti mm -hmm. and a Pep, against a Pep Guardiola. And it's history against each other. The team that won most, the most Champions Leagues in their history. 14 Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. And the team that wants to be the new biggest team in the world with Man City. How are you feeling on this one, Breton? It's exciting. Well, if, you, if we're going to go straight pattern finding here, let's go. 2020, uh, Manchester City, Real Madrid, Manchester City won. 2022, Manchester City, Real Madrid, Real Madrid won. Yep. 2023, we all know what happened. Manchester City won that one. Um, I, If I'm following my patterns correctly, I think it's Real Madrid's turn to win. I believe that I think it is. will be the case. No, Bretton. <laughs> I, I do I do too um ah! but uh, Pep, Pep Pep has already started his um his he's you know his head games in terms of it being incredibly effusive incredibly complimentary I mean as you should be of Real Madrid's best players Jude Bellingham in particular uh he's already out there and this game's not even getting played for three weeks so he's playing the long game Alex mm -hmm. um on this uh, but yeah Bellingham is one of the largest differences um between last year's Real Madrid team that lost and this year's and no Real Madrid Benzema. team and and no Benzema, which I think is obviously still a net net uh, advantage, obviously to to Manchester City. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jude Bellingham is kind of like I don't know a hybrid in in that sense. That weapon might overlay some of the cracks that show with Real Madrid without a real solid. Um, nine and Vinicius is rounding into form. Obviously, he's been in form, but he's been pretty red hot as of late. Um, it's just, it's just, mm, I, I don't know if there are like X factors beyond that. Like, do you e even factor there in is, a Thibaut Courtois being a, healthy? Yes, I do factor that. And the, another key factor is the second leg will be played yeah. in the Etihad, and we saw what happened last season. With That's the true. second leg being at the Etihad. It's also another right. key factor. But what I got to say, if Pep Guardiola mm -hmm. and Man City knock out Real Madrid, it will be the third time that that happens in the last five seasons. Pep Guardiola is bullying Real Madrid. And Real Madrid's locker room sure, know, sure knows who beats them. Pep Guardiola will have a massive... Massive target next season when Kylian Mbappé goes to Real Madrid. But this season, if Jude Bellingham manages to beat Man City, when Kylian Mbappé mm -hmm. still is coming in the summer, Hendrik is still coming in the summer, people will see Jude Bellingham as the best player in the world because he already did it. That's mm -hmm. last season winning the Champions League. So yeah. this is the biggest test possible that Jude Bellingham, Jude Bellingham can have. Cristiano Ronaldo won the Champions League in Lisbon. Gareth Bale won the Champions League in Wales. We had <laughs> Benzema won the Champions League in France. And now Jude okay. Bellingham has the chance in the 1st of June to win the Champions League in Wembley. I believe it can happen. Mm -hmm. And if it happens, Ballon d'Or first contender, no doubt in my mind. He's the favorite. Yeah. And the bookies right now, yeah. In Ballon d'Or favorites, they put Jude Bellingham first, 26%. Then they put uh, er, uh, Mbappé and Harry Kane, 21%, both tied, 20% Erling okay. Haaland. 
And then I see Lionel Messi 11%. Come on. If Messi wins it, that would be... I don't know what I don't know what he can do to win it. Copa America no. still. I don't know if I put Messi winning it. It's just mad that they're even considering Messi to win it. But uh, Kylian Mbappé, Erling, Erling yeah. Haaland, and Jude Bellingham, that's the top three for the Ballon d'Or. But Vinicius, oh, come uh, on, man. Go bold. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Um. What? Another couple goals over the weekend. Um, Six goals. And last Jude four Bellingham games. obviously was suspended. Uh. But the biggest test here is again that Real Madrid midfield. You've got uh, Shuamani, uh, obviously another year older. Kamavinga, another year older. Tony Cruz, uh, while uh he's a, a year older, he's obviously still very much in form. Um. And that the biggest battle is going to be Rodri. Jude Bellingham, right? Mm -hmm. Who's the better player? And this is the first Ballon d'Or hurdle, big hurdle for <laughs> Jude Bellingham based on that early season form. Because Jude if Bellingham. you get knocked out, yeah, if you get knocked out in the quarterfinals, I mean, that's 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 kind of a big blow, is it not? It I mean, is. that that put, that puts him, doesn't make him favorites anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for sure. So uh, this is what it's about. It's a rematch on rematch on rematch, but these teams are still set up um, pretty pretty differently uh mm -hmm. heading into this particular one um and, and pep is mm -hmm. still chasing he is chasing ancelotti right pep has three ucls to his name ancelotti's got four if i'm mm -hmm. not mistaken yes um so there's a little uh you know the charge chasing the master that type of that type of situation at this moment but then again pep's still so early in his career no, so i'm pretty sure he's gonna have a whole lot more than the three and imagine yeah. if, if just this is a big imagine but imagine if Man City win the FA Cup, the Premier League, and the Champions League again. They became yeah. European treble winners once again in back-to-back -back seasons. No one can say yeah. that they're not the best English team ever. The best manager, Pep Guardiola. The best midfielder ever, Kevin De Bruyne. And one of the best strikers mm -hmm. ever in the history of the Premier League, Erling Haaland, being one of the key factors of this happening. Rodri also. Midfielder of pure yeah. genius. The whole team yeah. is full of world-class players. But Real Madrid, they have reinforced themselves for this season to go against uh, Man City. Jude Bellingham, a new redefined 10. Abraham Diaz, yeah. that is a very positive player. José Lu, that is a good <laughs> backup player. So I, I like player. what I see. I like what I see. Lu Ming stepped I mean, up I, too. But... Lunin has he has not gotten enough credit this season, right? Uh, but I, I do think that the the biggest glaring hole here, the biggest glaring advantage that goes to Manchester City, um, is the defense. You know, uh, Real Madrid's defense is it, it's been decent, but I think their best defense has been their offense. Um, so we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see. We'll I think I'm see. still leaning Real Madrid here. I really do think I'm still leaning Real Madrid, but I don't really know how I can do that. Um, considering <laughs> that it's not like Manchester City doesn't look like last year's Manchester City per se. True. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm still going. My gut tells me Real Madrid. Uh, my brain tells me Manchester City. And and this is mad, Bretton. In the quarterfinals of Man City, Real Madrid, those are the toughest uh, away games you can have as a, as a team. Etihad True. is tough. We saw Etihad against Real Madrid last season. Bernabeu yeah. is extremely tough, too. Nobody wants to play there. It's never an easy matchup. So whoever wins, it's going to be historic. Let us know down below what are your predictions for the UCL. And let us know, do you agree or disagree with our statements? We focus yeah, And this on might be... Th mm -hmm. Well, I just one last comment. Like this might be stating the obvious, but also uh, I think it's the last two times, right? The winner of this particular tie... Uh, went on to win the Champions League. So you might be looking at the winner of the Champions League uh, coming out of this tie. Uh, that's probably stating the obvious, but um, that's what you get when you get two powerhouses. Uh, and then, yeah, and then they get to face the winner of Arsenal Bayern Munich <laughs> um, after this. That, that just seems a little lopsided on one side, does it not? <laughs> Completely. I wouldn't like to be in the position of Arsenal and Bayern Munich especially. But mm -mm. then, mm -mm. I wouldn't like to be in that position. But in the Europa League, I definitely would, wouldn't <laughs> want to be in the position of Atalanta. Atalanta are going to be playing Liverpool. Liverpool are no doubt in my mind favorites 
favorites towards winning the Europa League. And they're still an unbeaten team in all competitions in the Europa League with Bayern Leverkusen. But the bracket makes it possible. A historic final in Dublin between Leverkusen and Liverpool. That can happen, yeah. Bretton. Do you believe that's going to be the case? Oh, my days, it's too oh, early. It's only, too with, early. only with Kalmin Kelleher in oh. net, right? Come on. Have, having him lift the trophy in Dublin, wouldn't that be awesome instead uh, of out? No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. But, but, but Atalanta, I think, is a much trickier. No, Liverpool is the stronger team. But Atalanta beat a very strong sporting squad. Did they not? Uh, yes, I mean, but no, sporting... we, we have to remember that they. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that they might have shot themselves in the foot, but Atalanta. Not only beat them and went unbeaten in group, uh, I think it was group D in the Europa League, with Sporting in that group too, Yeah. right? They then also beat them in the knockout round after, obviously, the, the Champions League, uh, you know, mm -hmm. toilet bowl contenders uh, fell down into that, that little, uh, whatever it was, round of 16, oh, uh, two times over. Anyway, long story short, um, <clears throat> Atalanta should not be taken lightly. Uh, based on how they dispatched Sporting, not not twice, uh, twice, right? They beat them once at, did they at not beat? Yeah, they beat them once in Lisbon, mm -hmm. and they beat them once at home, and then they drew them once away and drew them once home as well. But that's pretty dang good. They also kept Victor Gilqueras relatively quiet. Mm -hmm. One penalty in those four. The issue is Liverpool's not coming at you with just Gilqueras. No, no, no. They're, they're coming sure. at you. Yeah, they're coming at with you with, yeah. Eight guns blazing, right? Mo mm -hmm. Salah, Gakpo, Darwin Nunes, uh, Luis Diaz. I don't know if Diogo Jota will be back in time, but I think he'll be up against it to get there. Uh, but I'm I'm with you when it comes down to it. I just uh, I also feel like if the injury crisis is still in in mm -hmm. injury mode, right? If Liverpool's still somewhat thin, um, Atalanta could surprise some people because so, Gasparini is uh, he's a hell of a boss in that's my opinion. The name. Gasperini. Gasperini is the yeah. man that makes Ademola Lukman come back in his career. The man who trusts Ademiral too back in the past. Yeah. A man who trusts now this season Charles de Ketelar towards uh, yeah. being the best version of himself. So I mm -hmm. do think that Gasperini deserves the credit that you're giving him. But I think it's going to be a very one-sided uh, two legs. I think Liverpool will be, be right. dominating these these two games. I think Atalanta different levels. I think they're they're not going to be able to withstand what's going to be coming. And what yeah, I wanted to say on yeah. Liverpool, and I, I think we, mm -hmm. I think we, I didn't oh, we didn't overlook, but we didn't mention this. And I wanted to say, yeah. Virgil Van Dijk this season, Breton has been the best centre back in the world. I know Ronald Araujo has been passed. That hasn't been passed once, dribbled once in the Champions League. But even though that's the case, Van Dijk's leadership. Van Dijk, even though all these injuries that are at Liverpool, he's stone cold, he's consistent, and he's the world-class player leading the way. He is the man that can make a quadruple happen. Virgil mm -hmm. Van Dijk is what makes the dream real with the quadruple. Europa League, I think, can happen. They're the favorites. They won the League Cup. FA Cup can happen. And they're still contending for the Premier League. Leadership. Virgil van Dijk, world-class player. And in the Euros, too, will be key for um, Le Oz Oz I don't know how to say it with the, with the Dutch, Dutch accent. But Virgil van Dijk, best center back in the world. You got Mo Salah, one of the best right wingers in the world. You got Alisson when he's back in form. One of the best goalkeepers in the world. Kelleher, also a yep. very good replacement. You got the best mm -hmm. fullbacks, or one of the best fullbacks in the world, because Grimaldo and Frank Pong are putting themselves in contention with numbers that Trent Alexander and Robertson have been doing consistently. And even in midfield now has been rebuilt. And with McAllister, with Hendo, a much better team is now the case. So I think Liverpool, yep. much better team this season. Last season of Jurgen Klopp, it's kind of poetic that it's in Dublin to the final in the Europa League. So, yeah, uh -huh. Liverpool, I think, are going to yeah. be winning this game. And, yes, I think it will be one second, yeah, as well, I mentioned. We, we unfortunately are uh, filming this before, what is it, the big FA Cup clash? Um, was that... <laughs> He'll yeah. win it. Yeah, He'll we're win filming it this before that. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, you have to remember, though, here, I, none of this, you know, Liverpool kind of uh, trudging onward would be even possible, right? Mm -hmm. If it weren't for the Bobby Clark, right, coming True. out of nowhere, the the Dans, um, 
who's who's the other one? Obviously, uh, the the fullback for, who I'm blanking on right now. Uh, Connor, Connor Bradley. Bradley. Right, Connor Bradley and Jarrell Kwanza. I mean, none of this would be possible if these kids did not come in, um, plug the gap initially, and then grow into their roles and just kind of. Uh, it, it feels almost Barcelona like in that respect, except they're maybe a little bit older. Uh, but they understand how to play under Klopp and they know what they're supposed to do and they try not to deviate from that. I'm not saying Quantz has been perfect, mm -hmm. uh, but my goodness, has have they been a godsend? for that Liverpool squad this season, because we are still talking them. We, even when they had three or four youngsters in the 11, we were still talking about them as favorites. True. Which I know if you have Salah, if you've got Diaz, if you've got all these players, yeah, they should be favorites, but we haven't seen Alexander Arnold, right? Robertson's still coming back to his best self. Um, and it, it's pretty crazy that that, that uh, consistency has remained there for Liverpool and that we're still talking about them as Europa League. Rightfully so. Uh, favorites, but it's a tricky road ahead because Benfica Marseille, uh, I, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you, you tell me what you think about this one, but it is uh, a, a Benfica that seems to be rounding into form again and a Marseille that boasts not just the goal scoring leader in the Europa League right now in Obama Yang with nine goals, but also the top assist leaders in Amin Harit and uh, Jonathan Klaus. So, I don't, and they've got a new boss. They've managed to ma manage that kind of craziness uh, coming in, and they've got yeah, they've got to go up against the Benfica team, um, <clears throat> where they're definitely good enough to win this thing. Ooh, it's bold, Bretson, with Leverkusen and Liverpool. I hope they are. It is. I really hope they are, because <laughs> I'd love saw, to go. We saw see some cracks. Ones. Uh, it's true, yeah. uh, and, but against Rangers too to beat them in the Ibrox. But you mentioned Benfica, yep. Marcel. Obama Yang, the all-time leading goal scorer in Europa League history with 33 goals. Crazy. Obama Yang, mm -hmm. that this season has 32 goal contributions, 23 goals, 9 assists. This is the man that Befica must stop, but I'm going to say something yep. that's bold. Even though Obama Yang has 32 goal contributions, the best player in this Marseille against Benfica on the pitch player mm. is going to be Zronevs. He was the best player in mm -hmm. both legs against Rangers in my eyes and Zronevs will go bold against Marseille because the world is watching and he wants to be starting in the Euros. I don't believe that's going to be the case but he wants that and if he wants that to be the well. case, these are the games that the world is watching. 100 million. Yeah. That's what I already see. And Zronevs was awarded Four times already this season, the best midfielder in the Portuguese league. He's been involved in every single game. He started in 20, and he's played in 25. That is, that's mad numbers. And at 19 years old, he's already regarded as a, a Portuguese national team player. And not like a, yep. not like a debate. It's an assurity that he's going to be always called up now. So that's the yeah. greatness. And I believe Benfica. Against Marcel is 50-50. And I want to see this first Ooh. leg in Lisbon. I want to see this first leg in Lisbon. And then I'll be mm -hmm. giving definitive predictions. Because I really think everything's possible in this game. I think it's really 50-50, yeah. Breton. Uh, Even Rafa. I, I has got 32 goals and 40. No, Rafa has 32 goal contributions in 43 matches this season. Gokshu uh, has 10 assists. Like, Marx Lunardo uh, has five goals scored in 10 shots on target. It's mad what's uh, happening at Benfica. But I still got to respect Marcel. But I believe they're going to be going through. But it's a 50-50 match. Uh, but isn't there also something happening, maybe bubbling under the hood here, uh, under the surface? Orkin Koksu uh, has come out with some negative comments. I have no comments. We've I have got no comments on that. yeah, yeah, okay. And Rafa Silva, I know, has previously said, well, whatever. Anyway, I think Benfica obviously has the quality to get through a Marseille. Um, and you know, just this is kind of just a fun statistic. But the last time Benfica played Marseille was back in 2010. Uh, there is. Uh, in the Europa League, uh, there is one guy that made a very, very big difference then who mm. currently – he played for them in 2010 and he Luke? plays for Benfica now. No, ah, no, sorry. He plays for Benfica now. <laughs> uh, in 2010 and he plays for Benfica now. Yeah. Uh. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a he's a wiry fella that seems to come up in big games. Um, has had quite the career in between there. 
uh, almost had a knock in this last Benfica game versus Rangers, or might might have even been taken off because of it. Mm. Who Light are you in nature, Angel Di Maria. What Angel Di Maria played for Marseille? What? No, no, no. He played for Benfica back in 2010. Oh, sorry. I was I was thinking a player that played for Marcel against Benfica <laughs> no, no, at that no, no, time. No. I'm so sorry. I'm no. so sorry. Obviously, Madi Maria. No. Yes. Well, that was that would definitely <laughs> throw you off if you were thinking that. I was like, oh, my gosh. Did he not play for them back in 2010? Oh, yeah, gosh. I looked did, at the roster. Okay. Did. Yeah. yeah he, and, he, and he played a big part. Benfica won that one, and I think they'll win this one, too. Mm. So. And the most in the players with most goal involvements in the Europa League mm-hmm. this season, Obama Young is first with ten, mm-hmm. Lukaku second with eight, and then we have three players with seven: Florian Wirtz, Amina Rit, and Jonathan Klaus. This Marseille yep. team sure knows how to score goals. But come on, Did Benfica, you? the drone F, come on, be the star that I'm expecting to see. But I, we mentioned uh, Liverpool against Bar Leverkusen as a final. It would be mad, Bretson, that if Bayer yeah. Leverkusen this season win the Bundesliga with so many points ahead of Bayern Munich, if Bayer Leverkusen mm-hmm. win the Europa League, beats in the Liverpool in the final, Xabi Alonso would already be regarded as one of the best managers in the world. That's yeah. the second I mean, season at Bayer Leverkusen. Mad yep. that he yeah. makes that happen. Uh, if it happens. And a Liverpool Leverkusen final would be like a Xabi Alonso sweepstakes. Winner. Winner gets Xabi Alonso. How about that? Uh, if he loses, uh, he goes to Bayern Munich. <laughs> there, you, there you go. There you go. Right. I like. I like that. I like uh, that. Let's make this happen. Oh. Um, but no, the other the other side of the bracket. I'm gonna say it. Um, true. True. Uh, true studs of that. Uh, Carabe- I'm sorry. I screwed this up. I screwed the delivery up. Yeah, but yeah. the true stars of the Europa League uh, were the was the Azerbaijani side. Karabakh. Um, not just taking Leverkusen almost to the sword in the first leg, uh, but then almost doing it in the second leg uh, before succumbing, essentially not just to Leverkusen. It wasn't to Leverkusen really at all. Mm -hmm. It was actually to one individual. It was Patrick Schick, (laughs) who has five goals, and he has started only one game for Bayer Leverkusen uh, in the whole Europa League. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's a crack. It's an issue... So you can look at it two different ways. You can say, "Oh my gosh, the resolve, the the act, the persistence, mm-hmm. the the doggedness, the ability to stay in the game and get things done, the determination. They're total winners, right? Mm-hmm. Then now they've not lost in 37 games this whole entire season." Or you can look at it and say, "It's a weakness. We just need to put them away." No. And Karabag did not have did not have the quality unfortunately to put them away. Um and uh, these other teams Maybe not West Ham, we'll see. But these other teams do have the quality to put them away. So you need to maybe worry about that some. But I think, yeah, considering that these games aren't being played for another month, I think Leverkusen will maybe be able to kind of cool down some. They'll get Boniface back. Boniface back, I'm sorry. They'll get some of their walking wounded uh, back up to full full health, hopefully, again. And I think that they'll be rejuvenated for this. So they're still very much favorites, in my opinion. But, like, we've seen this happen before with West Ham. West Ham looked like crap in leg one. That's what everyone wants. They want uh, David Moyes out. And then looked like world beaters, like Europa League favorites in leg two, right? <laughs> so what are you going to see against Bayer Leverkusen? Uh, do you think West Ham has a chance against Bayer Leverkusen? No chance. I think David Moyes no needs chance. to have his expectations. Um, not a reality. I don't want to what say a reality them? check to <laughs> West Ham fans, but I do believe Kudus is an extremely talented player too. Look at oh, that yeah. goal against Freiburg. <laughs> he dribbled from his own half to the the goal line and then the celebration so cold. Oh, good. Um, yep. And I do think Mohamed Kudus is one of the best African players in the world right now. If you see West Ham yes. play, he makes them tick. It's Paqueta, it's Kudus, it's Jared Bowen. It's a fantastic generation that we're seeing now at West Ham, led by David Moyes. And especially with the Declan Rice leaving, they still are in European competitions, okay? This is yep. back-to-back seasons, okay, that they're in this talk um so i i think west ham getting to this stage 
it's congratulations. It's fantastic. But now you're going yeah. against one of the favorites against Bayer Leverkusen. And I think Patrick yeah. Schick scoring those two goals, one in the 92nd minute and the other in the 97th minute. Yes, there's a lot of perseverance for that to happen, but a lot of it is <laughs> luck too. And Bayer Leverkusen this season, they have their luck by their side. And not a lot of teams <laughs> have luck. And when they do, you just have the momentum to keep going, keep going. And we're already... Yep in March, and they still haven't lost. So Bayer Leverkusen yeah. still being unbeaten in March. Bayer Leverkusen being 10 points ahead of a Bayern Munich in the Bundesliga. And Bayer Leverkusen being one of the favorites towards winning the Europa League. That's the greatness of Xabi Alonso in a team that hasn't won a Bundesliga title Shh. and a title, a single title in 30 years. So yeah. I think Moise, wow. just see what Xabi Alonso does and yeah. Be happy of the greatness <laughs> that you're witnessing. <laughs> and another one that's uh, going to be greatness. And it's the yes. only one that has the same, the, uh, the team, both teams play in the same league. It's AC Milan mm -hmm. against AS Roma. How are you feeling with this? Because Daniel De Rossi, he's going bold with Roma this season. Yeah. I, the weird thing that I would say is like under Mourinho, I would have said AC Milan uh ah, might have the upper on, hand just in how that they play not not uh, just that but but there's a um and yeah you see it with new bosses right there's a new boss bump um you've seen it with a lot of new bosses i mean marseille is undergoing one this right now right uh but then when you replace that with i guess a relatively capable coach right and daniela de rossi but also a club legend in de rossi um not just a legend there but also a legend in azuri history yeah. uh it it seems to have pushed and rejuvenated their most key players mm -hmm. um even further that makes them i mean if dybala and lukaku are playing as well as they are right now a month from now <laughs> ac milan's in serious trouble Facts. Uh, but uh, on the same end, like, you know, Mike Mignon has not had like the, the best of best of seasons. He also has a little bit of an injury worry now. Um, but he also made some key saves before going off in that last, uh, win. I don't know why I'm blanking on who they played. Uh, Slavia but Prague. I thank you. Thank you. Slavia Prague. That's right. And who was a man Prague. down? Uh -huh. Yeah. Who was mm -hmm. a man down? Right. Um, so yeah, there are some worries there with Milan, but they've also been getting, a lot from all sorts of places. Obviously, when Rafa Leao is on point, he's virtually unplayable, unmarkable. Uh, Christian Pulisic is now up to almost 20, I believe. Almost 20. He's at like 19 goal involvements this season. Um, last season, I think he had like three goals for Chelsea mm -hmm. all year. I know he was injured, but he's already played 30 games for them. 38 games, I'm sorry. Rafa Leao is 21. Ruben Loftus-Cheek is almost up to double digits in goals. Um, Olivier Giroud chimes in whenever he needs to. Um, I like this AC Milan team. I don't think they're good enough to win it all, mm -hmm. um, but I'm worried about AC Roma and, and the form that they're currently in um, because they're playing different right now. True. Pellegrini looks good. Cristante looks pretty good. Lukaku Dybala. El Shirawi is starting to chime in again. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is going to be a fun Serie A clash um, in in these quarterfinals. Uh, uh, and I, I'm going to go with AS Roma against AC Milan. I think Daniel De Rossi yeah. has been doing an extremely good job. Look at the way they beat Brighton. That was no luck. Yeah. That was pure tactics yeah. and a good team built right, You're right. there. And yeah. Daniel De Rossi and them, AS Roma. In, in AS Roma, in their four last seasons, they've gone mm -hmm. to uh, qu the quarterfinals of the European competitions. It's their fourth wow. season in the row, AS Roma, that they're in a major European competition in their quarterfinals. And this is no luck. This is good team built with Lukaku, Dybala, Gianluca Mancini, that it's mad that Gianluca Mancini isn't called up for the Italian national team. Lorenzo Pellegrini, that is brilliant with De Rossi. And Dybala yep. with 11 goal involvements this season. I'm seeing a bit of the Dybala that we saw in the past at Juve. So in 2024, Dybala has 11 goal involvements. And Rafa Leão has 11 goal involvements too. And Teo Hernandez yes, has 11 goal involvements mm -hmm. too. That left inside of Asa Milan, that's what carries the team. So it's going to be that a very is. interesting matchup. Daniel De Rossi with AS Roma has 12 games, 8 wins, 3 draws and only 1 loss to Inter. Wow. And I believe he's not going to have more losses 
with a Cimarron. I don't believe that's going to be the case. Oh, so you're saying AS Roma? I think Leverkusen. they're going to be going through. Yes, I don't like Pioli okay. at AC Milan. I think Pioli Ooh. has to leave next season. There needs to be a new manager at AC Milan, in my okay. opinion. I think that needs to be the. Well, case. listen, I'm I'm going to hold out hope here. I'm I'm going to I'm going to say AC Milan squeak by AS Roma. Um, mm. Even though I'm feeling the same pressure you are right now, although you feel the tide has turned in in the Gallo, Gallo Rossi, that's how you say it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Their favor, uh, but I will say AC Milan, Bayer Leverkusen in the semis, Benfica Liverpool in the semis, um, and uh, you know I think we have to root for the Shabby Alonso sweepstakes. But all four of those teams are worthy, in my opinion, of winning this Europa League title i I almost like this battle in some respects i almost like this battle in the europa league uh more so than than how it uh shook out in the quarterfinals and the draw in the quarterfinals of the champions league like these are all very exciting matchups in the europa league they're gonna be true so fun to watch so yeah i think we have top games in the champions league and in the europa league too so we're definitely lucky for what's to come let us know down below your predictions and let us know how you're thinking on what we just said now international break we had some surprises that we wanted to mention national team call-ups that we wanted to congratulate and national team call-ups that we want to point fingers and say what was that decision (laughs) my first one england being the one I want to congratulate the first call-ups of Jareth Brathwaite and Anthony mm-hmm. Gordon. I'm sure Pickford mm-hmm. must have said to Southgate, we need Brathwaite. Look at Everton. Look at how we play. I would have scored much more goals if I didn't have Brathwaite in front of him. And I think that's the case too. Happy to see yep. these two players. But personally, personally, I'm still not happy to see Jordan Henderson being called up for England. I understand <laughs> Jordan Henderson has a lot of experience Jordan Henderson has won a lot of silverware, one of the biggest legends of the last decade with Liverpool, but Jordan Henderson doesn't have the quality to start against a France, in my opinion. Okay? And, 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 and that the, shouldn't be the case. And this is the difference between, you know, De La Fuente and Spain, right? Mm-hmm. And Southgate in England. Southgate will uh, basically say Kabi Mainu has done wonderful things. He should get, you know, he's got a future. Uh, we're actively watching him. We want to see more of a sample size. Uh, and then, you know, last game he brought in Calvin Phillips. Now, obviously, he's dropped Calvin Phillips for this particular one, whereas Pau Cabarsi has played what? 13, 14 games for, for uh, Barcelona. And De La Fuente is like, all right, boom. Mm-hmm. Bring him up. Let's True. go. And he's calling up a 16-year-old routinely, like in La Mina Mall. Uh, obviously, there maybe there's a difference here, but you want to see, especially for friendlies, like you want to see mm-hmm. how he. You, you don't know. He could be a breakout star. You know, in in he could be another Jude Bellingham in terms of a rise to the top. Uh, like that. Jude Bellingham wasn't Mister Dominant at 18, but my goodness, he, he was still a. It, Mm-hmm. phenomenal, phenomenal player. And he's only, what, two years older than that. So, yeah. What is the uh, common ingredient, though, between Jaron Branthwaite and Anthony Gordon? It is Everton bread, ah, right? Uh, Anthony Gordon, obviously forced to move to Newcastle, has been great and I think is probably the only one that could allow mm-hmm. for Phil Foden to be where I think he should be, which is behind the strikers and not on the left wing, although I know that that's where you think he's going to be. Uh, but Anthony Gordon has been... Very much, in my opinion, uh, made up for what it costs to get him at Newcastle. Uh, And he's very much been a very bright spot for Newcastle in what has not been a great season, considering what I think their expectations were uh, heading into this. So, yeah, I I call for you. Obviously, we've been calling for for Branthwaite Mm -hmm. um, ever since they've been running out Harry Maguire uh, and and others. Uh, Mark, where he's injured, too. I think that, that's and, a yeah, big but, factor towards Brathway being called up. Yeah, and uh, we don't even really talk about Fakaya Tomori that much anymore in terms of you know where he should be in this depth chart, what he should be. I think Jared Branthwaite has mm-hmm. the ability to actually work his way into um, time mm-hmm. at the Euros. 
I yeah, think yeah, yeah. you could you could see an ascension, if you will, um, in there. I think it's very much uh, a place that is needed for depth for the English national team. So uh, it's great to see him. I think last year he came on strong on loan at PSV Eindhoven. Um, and it was great that they basically said, we need Jared Branthwaite uh, from the get-go at Everton. And uh, he's been a very calm, cool, collected head uh, in what has been a very tough time for that club. So. True, true. And, but I still didn't like yeah. to see Southgate's comments on Kobe Maino saying, I'm really like to see his ascension, but he's still not good enough to be called up. I know. What? I know. If you're good enough playing... You're good enough to be called up, Gareth Southgate, in my view, with Precisely. Kobe Maino. Kobe Maino yeah. would add so much quality and options to this England team. So it makes no sense, in my mind, for Kobe Maino right. not to be called up in these friendlies. In these friendlies. So then he can confirm to people that he deserves to be called up to the Euros. What can he do, literally, to be called up to the Euros? It's mad. Right. Kobe Maino, there's yeah. no chance. Oh, I hate that, that to be uh, the case. And and how do you feel about this? I I don't know if people have been following it, um, but the whole Ben White thing is pretty ridiculous. Um, Southgate obviously has come out and said, well, I can't keep him out of the squad mm -hmm. uh, based on where his form is because there's no doubt he is a English caliber player, right? Um, mm. For sure. I, I, I don't know if he'd walk into the 11, but my goodness, he would be a massive massive upgrade uh and massive depth piece for them long term especially as they try and chase a euros but there have been these talks although we haven't had a straight interview uh of ben white's side of things uh that says that ben white voluntarily turned down a england call-up and uh -huh. i just wanted to know like well how do you feel about that i feel like in the in the u.s that would be i wouldn't even know how to process that I honestly would not know how to press it. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I know. That's a different story. That's like, should he get called up? But, uh, that, but yeah, the whole Ben White thing, it's, it's crazy because everything is going well for him. In the, in the uh, I mean, he's quickly, be, he's loved at mm -hmm. Arsenal. Uh, loved by all the players. Um, just signed a new contract extension, rightfully so. And then he has the ability to be one of the leaders on a team. And I just, it feels weird that that is a favorite to win the euros yep. and it just feels weird that like ben white would if but we don't know the true story so i'm just no, speculating obviously, here obviously Th there's tension that it be some gareth dust southgate up. obviously there's a bit of ten there's but tension there's tension between gareth southgate and ben white but you only get so much time to play this game but i think ben right? white i think ben white if he doesn't trust the manager with gareth southgate I understand his position towards not wanting to be called up for England. He clearly doesn't respect Southgate. It's... Something must have happened between them. And honestly, if Gareth Southgate in England don't mm. win the Euros, mm. people will start saying, like, what happened with Ben White? Ben White would be a player that would help our possibility towards winning the Euros. We should right, sack but Gareth but Southgate. But what about your teammates? In this instance, like what about being in the trenches and, you know, fighting for the teammates, regardless of, say, uh, you know, disdain between you and or distrust between you and the gaffer. Right. I, that's what I that's what I can't reconcile I kind of long term. I think um, so I, I think the answer lies somewhere in between. Right. Mm -hmm. The answer lies somewhere in between. But I'm I, for one, I'm going to be. Yeah. England's deep. They're pretty dang, dang deep. Like, even without Ben White, they're still favorites, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what we're discussing here. But what I'm just looking at, I'm like, you only get to play so many international tournaments. You only get to play so many whatever, right? Not all of us can be Cristiano Ronaldo still putting 50 goals in the net at 30-some years old, right? Or closer to 40. Um, so your time is limited, and I just feel like it's one of those things, not that he's listening to, to me in any way, shape, or form. You're going to look back on 10, 15, 20 years from now and be like... I think we're talking. I, I think we're talking when we don't know the whole context. And Ben White, oh, knows of course it. not. Southgate knows course, it, right? And if they're not coming forward and talking about it, something was Bizarre. not right. Something happened right there. Right. And the whole group is mm. not talking about it. So the whole group is showing respect and not being in between both both people. So let us know I'm what you. you think about the whole uh, the whole Ben White situation. <laughs> if you agree that Maino should be called up, we mentioned Pau Cubarsi yeah. a lot. It was a debut for Paul Cubarsi to be called up for the Spanish national team. But there's mm -hmm. another player that was high. I'm, we, we mentioned him at FC Wonderkid a couple of weeks ago. Pavlovich mm -hmm. 
got the call up for Germany. If you don't know who this yeah. midfielder is, please watch Bayern Munich play because he makes them tick. Pavlovich literally put Kimmich on the bench some games because that's how good he yep. is. But Pavlovich with Julian Agosman leading the way in the Euros, with Kroos, with Gundogan, with Rudiger, with these veteran figures, Kimmich, and with the young guns of Pavlovich, Florian Wirtz, and Jamal Musiala, something can cook in Euro Absolutely. 2024 in home oh my gosh. turf. Florian Wirtz yes. this season, 10 goals, 17 assists. He's the top assister in European leagues. Jamal Musiala, yep. 13 goals scored, 7 assists. Mad numbers at Bayern Munich. And now you get Pavlovich getting the trust that he deserves. This new generation in Germany can make something happen. We're warning, and you guys should be aware. Florian Wirtz, for me, yeah. is the main contender to being the youngster of Euro 2024. Yeah. yeah. Main. Well, they're also, I think, uh, uh, I, I'm, well... Florian Wirtz, it, it almost feels like we haven't seen him in much of a, you know, a German jersey just yet, True. right? Well, we At least in, in insanely competitive games. And yeah, you're right. And especially like those names that you named, those are, that is a midfield slash attack uh, missing where you're missing a Thomas Mueller. Ah, Thomas Mueller. I know we still have Thomas Mueller, <laughs> right? But we are missing, but we are missing a in form, a younger uh, version of of that in this uh, maybe you have Nicholas full Krug, who's more of a target striker. Uh, they called up Maximilian Bayer, uh, young, another young player that's oh, looking for his first it. cap. I think, I think they're searching for, for somebody there that they might not have in the setup, but that, <clears throat> that very clearly that list of talent, um, you add that to the fact that they're hosts. And I'm just wondering whether or not it's a, a team that could go really, really far with the support of their nation behind them. Uh, in this in this Euros, or if it's going to be a shot across the bow type of situation, and then 2026 is where Germany's really, really, really going to shine, right, in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, but my goodness, Musiala and Wirtz, the, uh, you can't... I, you, there are very few uh, duos within the Euros uh, that I'm more excited to see on the pitch together uh, than those two heading into the, heading into the Euros this summer. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, Alexander Pavlovich is somebody that I think you're going to see him uh, those that don't know him, but you'll see him in a, a German shirt shortly. Uh, I think he'll go to the Euros regardless. Um, he'll he'll force his way in there, uh, even if he has a tepid uh, debut for them. But I think he will go to the Euros. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's too bold to say. But he has been that good for Bayern when he has come in, in a time of need for Bayern, too. Exactly. And, uh, and he's only 19 years old. Uh, still growing into his game. I think Serbia will be mad, but I don't think Serbia ever had a chance. Exactly. Uh, so Serbia yeah. <laughs> are the biggest losers in the Pavlovich being called up to Germany for sure. And I think yes. Milos Kaskeas, I saw a post. He's also from Serbia, went to Hungary. I didn't know that. I was yeah. surely very surprised of that being the case. And the future there of Turkey, go. it keeps on getting better by the season. Arda Guler, can I yield these? Orkun Kokshu is still young too. Mm -hmm. But now, yep. first call up, you got Kaplan, center back. You got Semi yep. Kilishoy, the Besiktas, mm -hmm. you wonder, kid. And you got Kan mm -hmm. that you're a huge fan, that is going very bold for Nuremberg. 13 goals scored True. this season. This man ain't yeah. stopping too. 18 years yeah. old. So the future yeah. of Turkey, just getting started. Just getting started. Yeah. And they need a rebuild. I. And I, I honestly don't know which one of those I'm most excited about. Um, that's, I, I that's for sure. Arda Goulet. Arda Goulet, Arda, no? Arda Goulet still? Still? Um, no, I mean, you're right in terms of the artistry with his feet and, and all that good stuff. I just want to see him healthy and see him producing again. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're getting there. We're getting there with that. But Kap Kaplan uh, is somebody that they plucked from uh, the Super League. I forget which team it was. Uh, but he, he spent like the last six, seven months in their academy. I think he was nursing an injury too, mm -hmm. came in and then, uh, he's been an absolute breath of fresh air for Ajax since coming in. I mean, he's basically already won over the center back position. He's only 20 years old. Um, so only time will tell, uh, whether or not this is like a, I don't know who was, who was one that we had high hopes on who's playing in the Bundesliga. Who is that? Schalke, that center back. I can't remember. Mm. 
<laughs> not Demi oh, Rell. I shouldn't do this. I uh, not well. Demi Rell was definitely one of them. This is another one of those guys that I'm. I think he's at Hoffenheim now. Mm. I can't remember his name. Oh, oh and Kabak. then there's Soyan Chu. Kabak went to Ozan Kabak. That went to Liverpool. Uh, Ozan Kabak. Thank you. Good job with that. Mm -hmm. Well done, sir. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's he, yeah. Uh, Coplin is one that I'm really excited to see. But there are a couple other center backs just really quickly to throw out there. Belgium mm -hmm. recently called up Coney Coney De Winter, 21 years old. Uh, he has been great in Syria. And then, uh, come on, man, your Irish roots have got to be beaming on this one. Jake O'Brien, 22 <laughs> years old, getting called up, went a, a, a like back channel essentially to. Lyon. Um, Lyon needed a defensive revamp, and they got it in the form of Jake O'Brien. He scored some big goals for them this season. I think he scored over the weekend, too. Um, and he's been one of their better players uh, in Lyon. Uh, but he got his first call up for Ireland. So two center backs finally get, or three center backs finally getting their just dues uh, in terms of call ups. Fool. So Ireland has a pretty young defense. Gavin Bazunu, Kelleher, Nathan yeah. Collins, and now you mean yeah. Clark? Oh, it's looking yeah, looking yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. And Morocco too. I wanted to give it. I wanted to shine some light on Morocco. Oh, ben boy. Seguir turned. Mar yep. um, ben Seguir will be representing Morocco. Brahim Diaz will be representing ba Morocco. <laughs> Bilal El Canus, we already know, is going to be representing Morocco. And now we yes, have. Sir. Ilias Ak Ak Akmash. Oh, no, you can help me out of here. I think it's uh, uh, Ilias Akomak. Akomak. I, I could be wrong with that. And yep. Youssef Lekedin, that is already uh, another fullback that can shine it for Morocco too. First call up. Yeah, I think he goes by UC. He's a yeah another fullback um, in that vein. But the the big one here is obviously Brahim Diaz. Um, yep. I know it was rumored, but to see it actually happen, I mean that's just such a just a massive I wouldn't call it an upgrade because they they obviously have El Canus they have uh, they've got a lot of great young players to build upon but mm -hmm. this is what happens uh when success happens um you tend you tend to see uh people gravitate towards you and Brahim Diaz has uh Elias um Ben Seguer, a uh, 19-year-old from Monaco. That's going to be one you want to watch as well. I think mm -hmm. he scored the other day for them. Yes. Uh, Morocco's just doing all the right stuff when it comes to uh, keeping those that have their roots, and that's what you love to see uh, about that. And it's not all front-loaded like Nigeria or something in terms of having 740 really good strikers. <laughs> Um, they've got, they've got it all over the pitch. So Morocco should be very, very good, uh, not just in Africa, but worldwide, uh, for years to come. Oh, this is um, really a Moroccan golden generation after they get to it, the semifinals and become the first African team to do so. Now they have Bilal right. Kanus growing, Ben Seguir growing, Brahim Diaz convinced, and Amrabat, Akimi. They're going to be veterans in this team. El Nesri, a really good striker. This is really True. a phenomenal time to be a Moroccan fan. It's, it's you're yeah. lucky. You're lucky, Moroccan fans. And Portugal, you I are. just wanted to say, on my end, Diogo Jota is injured. Pedro Neto is injured. Pedro Neto is going to be injured until May. Until May. This, Pedro Neto can and, and, never get rid of these injuries. Now it's yes. until at the end of May. We could see him not going to the Euros because of this. But called up, instead of him, we got Trinco. This is his first time being mm -hmm. called up. We got Chico Cezão. Arsenal fans saw a bit of him. Chico Cezão deserved that call up in my view. And we have a player that I wanted to highlight. In five years, he went from the third <laughs> division in Portugal to the second, to the first, and now to the Portuguese national team, Jota Silva. Not Jota that was at Celtic. Not Diogo <laughs> Jota that is at Liverpool. Jota Silva that plays for Vitória. Uh, this season, they're asking for wow. 10 million for Jota Silva. I fully believe he will be leaving for that price, and I think that's a very humble price for a player with his quality. He could go to League yeah. and start every match, he's got that quality. Wow. I won't say Premier League because Premier League intensity, physicality, a bit different, but definitely he can play in the Dutch League and in Liga at a high level. Jota Silva. Was uh, Jota Silva? W uh, what about Thiago Santos? Was he called up for the no, U21s at all? No, not called up. Still, still not called up. Hmm. Portugal, in terms of fullbacks, is very difficult. When you got Cancelo, yeah. Diogo Dalot, 
Ai, uh, Eduardo yeah. Quaresma, a lot of people were hoping to, to see him. But Portugal, mm. in terms of center backs, we're really lucky for the future. Eduardo Quaresma, yeah, Gonçalo Inácio, António Silva, mm -hmm. Tomás Araújo. Ai, I'm liking mm -hmm. what's happening. And it's only just starting. A lot more are going to yeah. come next. A lot more. And Diogo Costa is only 24. Like, the well, passes that's... he does. Like, at Arsenal, that Arsenal game, yes, he had some mistakes, Diogo Costa. But still, the range of passes he was showing mad that was mad yeah, some of those passes well but yes let well, us who, know. you guys are playing you guys <laughs> yes. are playing friendlies right we're at, we're headed into the usa ah. mexico <laughs> jamaica panama i think is the other team mm -hmm. we're headed into the Concacaf nations league semifinals which is great because we don't have a world cup qualifying campaign coming up right since we're hosting it three countries are hosting it for the first time and all getting their uh their ability to just kind of walk in there, uh, which is, you know, that's a double-edged sword. But with this, uh, this is going to be a good one for us, uh, but it's not without drama. Um, <laughs> you know, Gio Reyna, listen, I, I want to ask your thought process on this. Like, I know if we're dealing with, a, you know, if we're dealing with, a, and I'm not equating Gio Reyna to Cristiano Ronaldo, please do not get my, you know, words mixed up here. But, like, if Cristiano Ronaldo can stand, right, and kick a ball, he's he's likely getting called up, right? And uh, I just, like, Gio Reyna has barely played any football in the last how many months, Alex, right? Mm -hmm. Barely played any football. Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't playing at Dortmund. He went on loan to Nottingham Forest, thinking that he would be able to kind of walk in mm -hmm. to the team. And, um, you know, this is a pretty dang good coach too that mm -hmm. runs forest right now um some that's run spurs before i know it wasn't for that long <laughs> but um he ran wolves previously and in, in their early success uh that success that they've had and they've mm -hmm. been building on those building blocks ever since um and he clearly sees some issues with Gio Reyna as well and yet he does get called into this which for me is almost weird in Greg Burhalter because I feel like Greg Burhalter is like very practical in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, there aren't many people that can do what Gio Reyna does in our setup, exactly. but at the same time, at the same time, I just feel like there's enough, like Brendan Aronson can sort of do it and play multiple positions at the same time. Uh, and he has more goals and more, uh, <laughs> more playing time, even if he hasn't had a great season, uh, well, than Gio Reyna has recently. So I'm, I'm such on the fence with this. And the only thing I care about is why is he not playing? Well, the like, thing why with is the this, US, what is going on underneath the hood? In my yeah. view, the thing with the U S is I look at the U S midfield. There's two players that lock in always start Tyler Adams yep. and Weston McKinney. That other True. position, I think something can happen. Gio Reyna is that something can happen. Yes, he's not playing at a club level uh, consistently, and he's not showing his best football. That but needs to all. be the case. That <laughs> needs to be the case in order for him to be a better player. But would I call sure. him up for the U.S.? I would still call him up because he still has many intangibles, and he can still be a leading player in this U.S. national team in the next five to yeah. ten years. He still can be, yeah. but he, he must fix his club situation right now. Gio Reyna cannot afford not to start every week for the next two seasons. He it's must depressing. fix it. He must fix the situation it, it, in the summer. Must. It's depressing. It, you know, it, and we're looking at a, an American crop of players that um, I think will improve upon as the years go on. But like, you're looking at a, still a very young, solid uh, group of players. Weston McKenney's 25. Tyler Adams back on the field for Bournemouth. Great to see. Don't get injured again. <laughs> Also still 25, Eunice Musa, 21, Gio Reyna, 21, Johnny Cardoso, who's uh, come onto the scene in La Liga uh, for Real Betis, is 22, Pulisic, 25, Weya and Sargent, now 24, Ricardo Pepe, 21, Tillman, 21, Balogun, 22. Mm. I mean, this, this is a young group of players still, um, but at the same time, like the only one out of this whole crew that's not playing that's been brought in is obviously... Balogun has been Reyna. really impressing too. No, he has not been very impressive. You're right. You're no. right. And that's it is weird. It is weird, Alex, because we also have guys like you know Haji Wright is trying to pull his be best uh, Victor Giocara's impression in Coventry <laughs> at Coventry with like 16 goals this season. He just scored the match winner 
uh, in a comeback versus Wolves in the FA Cup quarterfinals to send them to Wembley for the first time in almost 40 years. Like in the extra in the extra time. (laughs) Him and Ellis Sims, another Everton player that's been cast aside and not, you know, used at Everton. Ellis Sims is already in double digit goals for them this season. Um, And then you have, yeah, Josh Sargent, who is out of things, is now working their way in. Um, but it's, it's a tough situation for me because I think really what it comes down to is we want to see Gio Reyna playing. Mm -hmm. Like there's no end, even if he's called, even if he, uh, has had a few stinkers, as long as he's playing, you're looking at it and saying Gio Reyna should be there. There's no argument, right? Because of those intangibles that you mentioned, because of the magic that sometimes he can produce. But the fact that he went from, you know, being a, a, a top, I wouldn't say a top producer, but when he was healthy, a top producer for a Dortmund team, one that was not quite a shoe in for the 11, but very close to one or definitely a super sub role to literally relegated to the bench is scary to me. And for somebody like, you know, we're still in nascent stages of building football here in the States. Um, There's probably an equivalent in Portuguese history. Um, I don't know what it is, Uh, but for us, it's like just play like just get Gio Reyna on the field somehow or an attitude adjustment whatever is needed it needs to happen fast uh because we need him in 2026 but anyway that's it that's all I got to say about development in football is no not always going up sometimes there's a lot of ups and downs I'll give it an example I think this player went to levels that we still haven't seen Gio Reyna go but Renat Sanch Khnat Sesh was True. one of the most talked wonder kids in the world of yep. football after Euro 2016. Where is he now? Yep. Not even called up for eh. Portugal. Not in a good it's situation true. and not playing consistently at a club level too. So I hope Giorena can have a remontada in his career and go to the right yeah. path because that's that can be the case because he's got the talent to make that happen. Please, Giorena, don't go yeah. to the MLS. Okay, I don't think that no, would be no, 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 the way don't. to go. But go instead to Eredivis. I think PSV, yeah. having a player like Gio Reyna, that would be mad. Yeah. Mad. And we've yeah. seen what they've done with players like Gio Reyna, like Xavi Simmons. Okay, I'm not... No, that's well, not the yeah, same no, level I mean, of you, talent. But, you, but, you, but you see, that was a yeah. good decision by uh, Xavi Simmons to go to PSV. That's what I mean. It yeah. would be for Gio Reyna too, a good decision to go to PSV. Uh, and it almost be in direct competition with a Malik Tillman, who has been great for PSV, although he wasn't great uh, in that Europa League. Uh, or I'm sorry, them bowing out of the Champions League. Um, I really thought that they had what it would take to move forward, but they in the end did not. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the future is still quote unquote bright. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're right. Uh, it's not it's not linear. It, it's it. it it does go up and down, and I yeah. really hope that that's the case for Reyna. It's just there's so much that points in the wrong direction right now. I mean, this is now, Alex, this is now not like one coach. This is multiple coaches that he's had dust up dust ups with, hmm. and that's that's a worrisome thing. It's a it's a worrisome thing for somebody that when he came onto the scene, you're like, oh my gosh, this is this is Pulisic and beyond. Like here <laughs> we go. Let's watch this happen. I like it. Mm. I like how you mentioned this is Pulisic and beyond. Tough, Let us know your tough. thoughts down below in the international break, in the Champions League, in the Europa League. Let us know down below what you agree, what you disagree. And if you're listening until now, follow us on Spotify. Follow us on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on YouTube. Follow us everywhere, please. FC Wonder Let's Kid. Go. That's the, ha- the, the, the handle. And thank you for listening until now, this episode 148. And thank you for going bold with us another week, people.